Hello, everyone, and welcome to In Conversation, a series uh, exploring the makings of our exhibitions. In this case, we're talking about Deep Fakes, Art Nets Double, an exhibition curated by our lead curator and director, Professor Sarah Candadine, at APFL Pavilion's Amplifier for Art, Science, and Society at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, APFL, Lausanne, an exhibition which has just been extended until May 1st, 2022. My name is Monica Antohi. I'm communications lead with APFL Pavilion's, and today we're welcoming William Trussell, Hi, William. Director and co-founder at ScanLab Project and the man behind one of the installations in our Deep Fake Start and Stubble um, exhibition called Replica Real Replica. Mr. Trussell is an architect, a professor of architecture and a founder of ScanLab Projects, co-founder of um, ScanLab Projects, uh, which is an award-winning creative studio, which, as they're saying, is digitizing the world. Hello, Will, and welcome to our In Conversation series. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I'm so glad we had a chance to, to talk on this uh, January morning. Um, uh, you, you're in the UK, but I wanted to, to first of all introduce um, who ScanLab is, who is William Trustel, and what brought you into this field. So you, you basically come from an architecture background, but let's start with uh, whatever you're comfortable with, all those three questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, um, uh, both Matt and I studied architecture together at the Barla School of Architecture at UCL and it was oh, like 13, 14 years ago that we were both studying our masters together and, and discovered laser scanning and scanning technologies in more more general sense and we were just blown away by just how incredible this ability to take things in the workshop or the world and turn them into things that you could actually manipulate and play with on your computer. That just absolutely like blew our minds that back then. Um, and at the time we were in um, uh, a unit uh, called Unit 23 with Bob Scheel and Emmanuel Vercruz, who was, you know, our, our, our interest really was manufacturing and, and digital manufacture and just one of those loops between carving and creating shapes and objects and forms in the workshop in a very traditional sense just had no like transform into that digital world whilst we were also playing with our um, our CAD software to build 3D prints and laser cut objects and and uh, you know etch and laser cut steel you know these two worlds just were very separate from each other so linking that together was an incredible step and the fact that we could do it in our workshop was mind-blowing and then we went to yeah. to talk to the geomatic department who, who were like oh we've been doing this for years and we also do cities and we just went oh my gosh isn't that amazing talking uh, to people kind of does that <laughs> and so that that took us on a, on the course to where we are today um and and scanlab started in a in a funny kind of way um uh, matt and i decided to set aside a week just to uh, like experiment with the scanner and the university had been loaned one of the kind of old school lidar machines and when you look at them today they're about 120 thousand pounds worth um they're big things um you had to communicate to it via uh ethernet and uh we were like we're really gonna need to sit down and test this thing um and so we hired the studios over at the slade school of art and um mm. we just threw everything at the scanner so we did a series of scans on life models and hired some life models to come in. So we did sort of a homage to Duchamp, uh, you know, a new descending a staircase and, and scanned repeatedly that person as they kept going down the staircase. We made um, small smoke bombs and fires in boxes and set them off to see if the scanner would pick up that. Uh, at the time, I was really preoccupied with architecture made of weather. So I tried my best to make a cloud. I also made a rainbow, um, both of which just about scanned. Um, so we had this incredible week of just experimenting and pushing the limits and seeing what what were really right at the edges of the technology and how far, what's, what's the limits of perception, basically. And then so we, we left uh, university, got on with some day jobs and uh, had the opportunity maybe about a year later to take the technology to the Arctic and through a futurist conversation with scientists of friends of friends um, were about two weeks later on a boat heading towards the North Pole. And we were at that, that point realised 
wow this this could take us to some great places we can do some amazing holiday trips and uh have some great for, stories for, and for work for work exactly <laughs> yeah how amazing is that so yeah. um we <laughs> we basically ended up uh quitting our jobs after that project and trying to make a go of it full time eating potatoes and beans on toast for a few years until things kind of got got taken up and things went forward so that's the sort of that's the formation and that sort of test week that we did really kind of set the premise for what, where ScanLab came from it's sort of you know looking at this as a revolutionary new medium um and in our eyes it was the sort of evolution of photography uh we thought you know back then so this was going to be so powerful and so crucial to the future let's let's dive in and see where it takes us and obviously now with the metaverse and uh, augmented and virtual reality worlds uh you know relying on spatial capture to place things in the right world there's a sort of fundamental way in which spatial capture operates now in our world whether that's driverless cars or all of that um but also just as a creative format a, a form of photography that's kind of been just such a an incredible source of inspiration and projects and collaborative work over the years um so i think we've got maybe a showreel which does a much better job at talking about yes. projects than me <laughs> so uh, maybe i can try and talk over the top a bit of uh, a few of those So the first one is the New York Times, so I'll come back to that. This is the piece of ice we went to go scan in the Arctic amongst about 20 other pieces. Um, and so, yeah, our work spans collabor collaborations with scientists. Um, it's collaborations with broadcasters, uh, other creatives, whether they can be in music, like here, this is Obey, or um, forensic uh, archaeologists. There was some work there with forensic architects. This is the BBC. So it's it's really lovely that we have this quite array of uh, collaborative projects across all sorts of genres. It means it keeps us on our toes. No two projects are often the same. And quite early on in Scan Labs history, we realised uh, it was very difficult to visualise this data. It's quite dense. Um, it's computationally intensive, um, and so. We needed to develop our own technology to render it and see it and view it. And so a lot of our other side of the uh, studio, our research and innovation side, has been in developing uh, an offline rendering engine and a real-time rendering engine so we can explore these data sets uh, and kind of go through them. So, uh, And then another aspect of our work is in uh, uh, sort of heritage or spatial capture. Uh, and so we've worked with you know, museums or archaeologists or scientists in that respect, just going out to measure and record. And that can be as, as important as a, an incredible moment in time, you know, as something gets dismantled and is there never again. This is work with the Science Museum for the Shipping Galleries, which was a, an incredible kind of 60s exhibition which was being uh, decommissioned and the scan forms the sort of final record of, sort of the digital memory of that place before um, it was put in the skip and all the models sent back to the sheds of people around the world who had contributed contributed it originally to the exhibition. So um, yeah, there's lots of really lovely themes about memory, about um, time and and photography and sort of permanence in the world that are beginning to really kind of come through over the years through our work. And uh, we've also done a number of projects over the years which have been sort of more self-initiated. And um, I'll come to a few of them later on, but they're really exciting ways where we get to explore themes that have popped up in our heads and our sort of creative itches. We've really loved to have uh, scratched and they've turned into really incredible big projects in themselves and um, we've got one at the end uh, which I'll, I'll wrap up talking about so yeah it's a uh, you know we love collaborating we love working uh, with our own work and it's across so many genres it makes your head spin a bit at times 
Yeah, so you you've you brought in a couple of well multiple um, um, cool ideas and cool topics to to explore. Um, one of them being the beginnings of, of photogrammetry and lidar scanning and, and all kinds of you know augmented reality and, and VR um, and and how how that field has grown and blown up basically and it's basically in every aspect of our lives pretty much in every aspect of our lives with um from you know from from from, from cars from um uh, uh driverless uh, uh cars to um scanning monuments to scanning um um, um objects of art to to scanning cultural uh things that are happening like right now like like we were talking about with with uh, terry's installation um we're talking about such a huge array of subjects and uh, fields, you know, where where this kind of applies to, um, which is mind blowing. And then, uh, you, you know, like you're talking about like specific projects into the future, which I can't wait to get to. Um, but before we get to the cool uh, stuff that's happening in the future or starting to happen now, um, can we go explore your project that you guys did um, with us uh, for us the the replica real replica um and and talk a bit more about that because that's um it it it, it kind of touches on on the stuff that you're talking about the the cultural aspects the the the, the you know the scanning the people scanning of, of objects scanning of uh and bringing and melding all of that together um because it's not it's not a scan of something it's not just a real scan it's 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 there's more to it isn't there <laughs> there's a few it gets a bit meta yeah there are a few layers to what's going on um and I guess the the start for the sort of the description for us really is that um, the Sir John Soe Museum, um, which is what we look at here, is just an incredible museum in London. And if you ever get the chance, please go and visit, especially if you can be there for the candlelit tour in the winter, as just absolutely tickles sort of the back of your neck. And um, as the soon museum, as COVID's over, yeah. Like, um... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And what's what, what I find amazing about the Soe Museum is that it's just an Aladdin's cave of history. Um, Sir John Soane, you know, went on the grand tour himself, uh, but realised that his students at the um, at the RCA weren't able to follow in his footsteps, and so he brought lots of items and replicas and castings and unique artifacts from his time abroad to his house and used those as teaching tools for students to learn about columns and architectural details and form and layout and all of those incredible things that then later on and during informed his own work himself so if you think about this uh with respect to like a mirror image today it's a bit like a big archive you know it's the sort of it's not quite the wikipedia but it's it's an incredible trevor trove of information and resource for people to go to it's a it's a library of its times and we are over the years in a fortunate position where we've been to some amazing places and have our own incredible library and we were so sort of gently kind of hinting at some of the the parallels between what we have stacked on several petabytes of server space in our server room being akin to the uh, incredible library that the Sane have. Um, it's a lot less interesting to come have a candlelit tour of our servers though. Um, so <laughs> Depends if, if you're if you're into that kind of <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing you can come. Um, but um, as a as a as a tactile person it's not as sexy. But it does have incredible value creatively for us and and also they all are incredible snapshots of time and places and we've uh, we've been able to use it uh, for science for that reason as well you know having this ability to track change and the detail through which scanning can record and digitize a space to allow you to go back to revisit it to measure like the to the infinite degree like a small movement or change or or a monitor a movement or change is really lovely so the project kind of came from that like syn synergy and the other thing that we've been really interested in is that lots of the models within the zone and artifacts within the zone are replicas of real places so we have this moment where 
we've scanned the replica in the museum, but we've also scanned the real thing somewhere. And that's really evident in the first place that we go to here, which is the Pompeii model within the model room. And the National Lottery funded the renovation of this room um, a, a number of years ago. And then as part of that, they restored it to the way it was uh, with the models. And uh, so we came in to build uh, a digital complement to that and built the same a little explore website where you get to go in and run, run around and look at all these models. And uh, so we scanned here the model of Pompeii. Um, and we actually also have the fortune of having been to Pompeii and scanned uh, the whole of Pompeii, both from the air using a drone, but also on the ground for a separate project for a broadcaster. So we had these two data sets that were just like, you know, in our minds, something we've always wanted to do with the two, which is this kind of merging of those yeah. two places so that we can take you from one to the other. Um, and the other other layer there in uh, Pompeii is that um, back in, it was like 18... 1860 18 yeah 1860 that the Pompeii director of excavations realized that the people who had been uh, captured in tufo in that pyroclastic flow and turned into mm -hmm. stone were casts of themselves um the inside of them of them has obviously disappeared but the the, the rock had solidified yeah. around them so he had the genius idea of pouring plaster into those and then chipping off the, the volcanic ash around them and then was, you know, gave them a sense, a clearer sense of who these people were. And a lot of their bones are uh, encapsulated in them. Um, and they're quite, quite ghostly figures um, yeah. through all sorts of various reasons. Um, and we were there to CT scan them. Um, to see inside because we had some really lovely scientists from Australia um, whose name escapes me but she's got a great sense of being able to look at a skeleton and say okay well this this is of a certain age a certain uh, gender and they might have had this kind of lifestyle based on the the strength of their bones or the length of their bones and things like that so she was able to kind of look into their lives and offer an interesting perspective of who was at that time in the wrong place um and so there's a little exhibition that we travel into here that that we scanned and we sort of make that transition between the drone data the lidar on the ground the photogrammetry of the casts and the ct data as a sort of hopefully relatively seamless transition um through uh and so the film they're is a kind of ghostly. they're coming there they are yeah <laughs> so the, the film is a is a 20 minute uh, museum paced contemplative piece with some beautiful music by Pascal uh, Wise. Um, and quite meditative. Show. Yeah. Quite meditative it's... when you're in the space. It's quite like you're, you're in that environment and it's, it's difficult to pull away. Um, yeah. And it has that, that, that pace that almost like that museum pace you know when you've been walking around looking at an incredible gallery and you, you're just slowly kind of moving through and trying to absorb it so much mm -hmm. and the other thing that we're really interested in doing here is using a, um, a spherical lens so this is not a traditional perspectival camera we've built our own mm -hmm. spherical camera so you're seeing in all directions in one singular frame and so it has this quite beautiful quite slow like uh, modulation as things wrap and move um, and it's designed to be played back as unfolded so you're looking at this sphere unwrapped like a map and, and showing in front of you um, it's it's quite it's pretty wild if you do watch it in a headset in full 360 but it's because it's moving so fast um even though it's slow to the eye here it's um it's a bit of a vomit comet as a, of a roller coaster <laughs> so i wouldn't it's advise. all about perspective isn't it it's all about perspective here it's nice and meditative uh you know 3d glasses on not so much <laughs> <laughs> exactly um, so part one, we go to Pompeii, uh, and then uh, part two, we get to go to the Valley of the Kings. Um, 
and interestingly we spent far longer negotiating with all the data owners and the, and the rights holders than we did actually creating the film it's about 10 months of contract negotiation and uh, you know maybe it's a, a, a subject to gloss over now but come back to um which is sort of you know data sovereignty and rights and yeah. the value people put on digital replicas of places um and it's a really it's a really interesting conversation there's all sorts of balances between sort of openness and uh, the opposite end of that being quite uh, closed and yeah it's a it's an interesting world to na navigate um, so we pull back out go into the museum and uh, the other star attraction um, certainly in Soames, Sir John Soames' eyes is the sarcophagus of uh, Seti the first um, and he acquired that um, quite by luck um, back in sort of 18 uh 1800s it was it was uncovered um by um this incredible circus strongman called uh uh giovanni belzoni back in 1817 uh on a trip to the valley of the kings and he originally tried to sell the sarcophagus to the british museum <laughs> uh they turned it down and he was like straight in there like a shot and brought it. It's the most expensive thing that he brought. It was two thousand um, pounds back then, and I can't imagine how much money that is. But that probably be a life changing amount of money um, in today's uh, uh, pounds. And so he had a three day party uh, when it arrived, and uh, yeah, it was an incredible event for him. Um, and again there's like layers here that we try and express quite subtly and that's um that this is a displaced uh, uh artifact you know it sh should in some people's eyes and certainly mine be back in the valley of the kings where it, it was first placed um so we're able to kind of do that digitally here so as you fly through and around the picture room we go down into the crypt of the museum and uh, show you that sarcophagus, which has um, uh, Belzoni's name etched in the, in the rim, and then we are able to take uh, the data from the Valley of the Kings from Facta Marte, uh, who scanned it several years ago, and place it back in that digitally. So, and then we go up through the tomb out to the Valley of the Kings, where the University of Turin and uh, members there have kindly lent us data of the valley. And then we go back down again, back into the zone and back round to the start. So it's a big, big loop um, where you can kind of join on this journey at any point. Um, it's, a, it's a good blend of uh, uh, real and deep fake and real and deep fake and um it's 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 perfect for our exhibition actually um clearly um sarah did a phenomenal job our creator uh in, in bringing all this together and to, to emphasize the the this uh blend of of uh real artifacts with um with digitized versions and and uh, things that are going to live only in the metaverse um uh, also in um, so, it, it, but but specifically this scan, um, the way you guys envisioned it, the way you guys brought it together, um, the flawless movement between what's actually been scanned, like what's the real part of this house and, and you know the museum, the the Stone uh, John Stone Museum, um, and and jumping to real locations and scanning, you know, uh, it feels like we're in a whole new universe. That's the tomb, isn't it? That's the that's the sarcophagus, and now sarcophagus. yeah, that's it. Now we're in the tomb, yeah. And it's just the most incredible place. Um, and, and the other thing that, you know, not being an expert in archaeology, uh, having spoken to people along the way, is that some people's opinion is that archaeology isn't about savouring this one moment in time, although scanners are really good at recording that one moment in time. But yeah. you know, these places have a history, and whether it's the Egyptian history or the recent history, all those layers are really interesting and there's a moment here where you look up on the ceiling and people have left their mark and their name and um you know some people back yeah. then and now would view that as vandalism and other people would see that as another layer on on the artifact um uh, so 
yeah, the question of whether you should go back and remove that and return it to its original state is a, an interesting debate about the time and preservation of places. Uh, and I think digital technology like scanning has a really interesting role in, in mediating some of that argument um, because you can use it to record those snapshots. Um, and Factum and Adam Lowe have used it to great effect because they have been in to scan the tomb and then they've used that to actually manufacture a one-to-one -one facsimile which they put on exhibition. So in, in Basel, uh, I don't know if you popped along to see it, um, it's an incredible replica of the tomb and that's got all sorts of amazing uses both as uh, science but also for sort of visitor impact I guess that's one of the big problems that the the valley and the Ministry of Antiquities have in Egypt is that just so many people passing through this space is destroying it and exactly if you can provide a version to the untrained eye that is indistinguishable from the original is that a deception or is that a, is that hero's work on saving the original um, and I think that's a really interesting debate that's perspective ongoing. yeah again different of, of, of opinion pers different of uh different perspectives but um in the museum world we, there's this you know clear trend in preserving and offering um things like uh, you know access to cultural sites like this um through digital experiences because there's like like you said we're we're damaging all of these cultural sites we're we're, we're damaging what was there um you know the the, the air um, exposure alone um not to mention the carbon dioxide that we're exuding um you know temperature variations all of that tend to kind of destroy a site especially when it comes to colors and 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 specific oils and the paints and oils and the you know the, the how how it was created so yeah it's a matter of perspective i think i think uh you know museology and scanning uh technology are doing a phenomenal job in preserving cultural heritage and and that's you know uh to me that's what you, you know that this is um in a very cool coolly very cool presented way uh where we're showing so many aspects of of history yeah we're showing 1800s but we're also showing Pompeii we're showing um uh, the, Valley, the Valley of the Kings and things that people might or might not be able to see in their lifetime in 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 real in the real world so um yeah uh hero's work uh, I'm I'm more on the on the camp of uh <laughs> hero's work um this is. <laughs> thank you very so, much um, yeah, I think it's got a long way to go as well. I think that's one of the exciting things is that the, the resolution has a few bottlenecks in terms of devices and hardware. But it's, you know, if you look back to where the original scanners were 10, 15 years ago and their resolution, it's it's quite astronomic where you might project that to be in another 10 years time, you know. Um, as as you get kind of closer to the point cloud at the moment, and the distance between the points uh, means you can, can't get too close, or at least you just need to have another layer of resolution. Um, and I, in the not too distant future, there's going to be a moment when you can just keep zooming in, and and you're closer than you could be the, than with the human eye. And I think that's a really interesting moment when the digital is as detailed as the real world and you can't tell the difference and it, it's more obvious when you're physically create recreating that but in a because yeah. in the digital world you can always keep zooming in you can always go closer that that power of 10 movie that the eames uh did back in the 60s is like testament to that like that couple laying on the um uh gar they're on a, like a picnic blanket in new york and the film goes from the universe to the to the quantum um ac across that scales and you know as a human you can't get much further than banging your head on the on the carpet um so <laughs> <laughs> it's it's lovely to to allow that to happen in the digital world um so resolution is a difficult uh, thing when when you in pure in a pure digital world but in this case, um, you, what kind of technology have you guys used here? Can we talk a little bit about um, the technology and resolution yeah. and technical, some, some, some geeky technical stuff? Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so 
the data sets vary uh, of their capture. Um, this data set is from Factum and they've used the laser scanner. Uh, they used a, um, a Faro 120, I believe, and uh, uh, that's able to record the world as a, a point cloud. And each cloud can be anywhere between 50 and 750 million points, depending on whether you've cranked up to 11 on the dials or you've you've gone for something a bit more manageable. And uh, that records um, uh, a kind of black and white infrared cloud, which you can just see in the peripheral of this frame. And mm. it also takes a series of photos and then applies that color to the point cloud. And so the reason why there's a couple of clouds that are black and white is because they've lowered the scanner at the time into a, an area that's looking a little bit rough and hasn't got any lighting. So they've just done a black and white scan. But we thought it was really interesting to see that kind of back of house kind of behind the scenes. Yeah, There's actually a huge tunnel right underneath the sarcophagus now that they haven't scanned, which they, they've been digging recently to find what they thought was an extension to the tomb. But that's another story. Um, okay. Then the, uh, the sarcophagus that we're in now was uh, scanned using photogrammetry. Um, and Factum had done that and lent us the data. And that's really detailed, you know, that's that's detailed enough that they could replicate uh, a physical copy of it without you knowing the difference. Uh, so it's a very high resolution um, mesh, uh, when, which we've turned into a point cloud. And that's they were they really were pushing their limits there in terms of processing all of those photos. I think they had several uh, thousands, I think we're talking tens of thousands of photos there. Um, we're now, at that point in technology yes. in advancement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we tend to use either LIDAR or photogrammetry or both on projects. And so, uh, you know, our project point clouds can be anywhere. Well, when you add time into this and we'll get to it, things explode. But like a single scan. Uh, could be a billion points without a problem for us. You know, we deal with multi-billion uh, point point clouds, um, and our engine is built to kind of handle that in its sort of bread and butter way, which is incredible. So, I I haven't done the maths on the rendering for this project, but the one that we've just done for the dome, so we've done a, an actual three hundred and sixty version in stereo for EPFL's incredible dome. So if anyone is in the area and can pop down to see that, I hope you can. It's in the stages of finalize, finalizing that. But that's 16K by 2K, and that's about 7,000 hours of rendering for us. Wow. And, uh, the data sets on that aren't that big, They're just a couple of terabytes. Um, so yeah, we have, we have kind of petabytes storage challenges at ScanLab, and we have a whole array of render nodes that crunch through lots of data. Um, the same here is about 80, 90 scans. Um, the Valley of the Kings is similarly, it's about 100 scans. And Pompeii, the drone, was about yeah. 3,000 photos, but that was done about four years ago. And it's funny, because it took me, about three weeks to process it using software at the time. And uh, I reprocessed, reprocessed it for this project and it only took me three days. Uh, so I was like, Technology. Oh, uh, <laughs> if only I could have yeah, had that at the time, it would have been much easier. So yeah, processing has certainly come along a long way. Um, and the, the thing about time is that um, our recent work takes this level of scanning, but does a, a frame every hour or every day um, so we're now exploring time in those data sets as well looking at kind of big landscape changes or people changes or things like that so setting the scanner up let's, let's say like at a station and then firing that off as fast as we can for you know 24 hour period or one year period or whatever we can so suddenly are like oh, okay we can handle this data set has just been like taken to a new level recently um, let's talk about some of those projects. Um, like this one, the the one we're looking at right now, it's uh, a few years old, um, and it's complete, right? It's 
as, as long as you don't add any more rooms to, you know, to the scan and go into any more uh, rabbit holes, it should be a pretty complete a project at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, I, we, I could just plug here that we're, we're building right now an extension to the Sones Explore website. Um, we've just scanned the picture room, which is that really beautiful one that we swing through as we go down into the crypts. And in there are some incredible paintings on it. God knows how many millions of pounds worth of paintings are in there. There's Hogarth's, Turner's, the lot, and they're all on swinging um, doors and windows. So we've scanned it both sides. And the, the idea is that you can go into that room and now open those panels digitally, because you need to have someone with you know, special white gloves for the museum to open those panels for you. And you can only get two people in the room because they're quite big panels. Um, so yeah, that's, that's coming. That's not quite finished. Um, exciting and uh yeah i'll let you know when it's out um so yeah the, the museum it, yeah not a bad job at capturing it there's always more and more that we'd love to capture here all right so let's go to uh what you're currently working on what's what's exciting for you right now um you were mentioning uh this particular project uh tell us about it yeah so i just wanted to dip our toes into this one because it's using scanning in a slightly different way but it's mirroring a lot of the current usage of lots of lidar and that's to do with self-driving cars so a lot of uh, the, the requirements for the car as it drives through our world is that it senses and understands it and to do that there are various ways one is photogrammetry and tesla and elon musk is a big uh, fan of doing just photogrammetry um, to build that model in real time. Um, others think that LiDAR is a better solution to that technology. And so what we wanted to do with this project, the New York Times, is kind of show you a little bit under the hood of like what that looks like. If you could see through the eyes of the scanner and the car, uh, what world would we be living in? Um, so it's a little glimpse into the like behind the curtain of the metaverse of driving cars and so we took our lidar and we bolted it onto matt's car and then he drove it through the city and there's lots of interesting artifacts that happen in that world as you do that uh, because you're moving the scanner the speed of the car is proportional to the resolution so when you're mm. zipping down the motorway at 60 miles an hour the scanner is only able to see every you know 10 centimeters or so um, whilst if you're stopped at traffic lights but the scanner is still going you're just increasing the resolution of that model sort of exponentially and, and that fully applies to the real world uh cars and it's it's such a very cool way of looking at uh, this i want to see it again if that's okay with you yeah of course um it, it unbelievable that we can actually see what cars see cars are not going to necessarily see it this way but it's all ones and zeros probably um, yeah there's some artistic licensing going on a, a little bit but yes absolutely um and so and the other thing is that um you know some of the repercussions of that will be quite interesting so if you imagine all of the taxis have self-driving equipment on it and by virtue of that they're going to be scanning as they go and so densely populated areas where lots of taxis go are going to be incredibly well mapped you know to the hour or day every time a, um, a taxi goes past you're going to have a record of that whereas someone who lives out you know in the middle of the sticks um, is going to have a car once a month or once a week update that internal model and that's quite interesting if you think about that as a resource for someone to look at or use you know could or should this be data sets that are freely open um like the ordnance survey you know is there a custodian of that data set um you know would the council put lidar scanners on every bin truck and therefore you know use that to monitor you know where you've been parking your car or where you put your bins in the wrong place and <laughs> or, you know all of that kind of stuff um you know having that model update in real time is quite interesting and who owns that data and uh like how frequently is it updated because it's on a particular truck uh are all really interesting like knock-on questions that are, are really interesting to sort of debate and talk about yeah we're talking about ethics we're talking about uh all kinds of um things that you you don't think about talking about when you talk about 
getting a scan of your environment. Um, but but there's ethics involved, <laughs> and there's uh because you don't want to get a ticket because you parked your car and it showed up on on somebody's uh you know like on the latest scan. Uh, yeah, you, you know we're having cars. these we're having all these problems with like ring doorbells and things like that. You know the police have yeah. access to that data set and for good and for bad. You know, uh, and it's a really that's a really dangerous uh, subject. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, besides the ethical issues, there's uh, the, the scanning that is being done. It's it's doing it's scanning the solids. Well, we're humans are we're solid as well. It, the immovable objects. We're, we're scanning, um, you know, the the trash cans. We're scanning the buildings. We're scanning the turns in the road. But in terms of scanning people, and you know you were talking about 10 frames per second when it's at speed. Um, and then you're talking about much faster when you're, uh, when it's stationary. Um, and how is that? Like, are you able, were you able to, to scan humans? Were you able to, to scan people while you were, uh, while you were doing the scan? Um, in that particular scan, yes, we capture cyclists as we, as we go past and they're just little wisps of the outline. Yeah um and they also then cause a shadow so that person then blocks the car or the building behind so yeah we do there are artifacts you know we do have to go get filming permissions for projects like that because you're you're in the proper realm you've got a camera um so yeah there are things like that luckily you can't make out who anyone is um so there's no real privacy problems that we could foresee and that world is quite distorted as well what we didn't do is extrude it using the GPS of the car, we just extruded it using a vector. So you can, what, what we ended up doing there, which took me a while to get my head around is that you're, if you just use a hundred meters every time, you're able to make a data set that's a record of like spatial dimension, but also time. Mm. So you're looking at uh, when we stop at a bus, at a traffic light uh, and we're next to a bus, we keep scanning. So if we just extrude it by a hundred, you know, 75% of that meter is uh, like an extruded bus. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's all sorts of weird things. Um, similarly to actually, you know, the, uh, slit scan photography that you have at the end of, uh, a uh, hundred meter or uh, a race, a horse race, uh, finishing mm -hmm. line, but the, the negative Multiple. is yeah. moving at the same speed. You get similar sort of time dilation effects very cool uh visual effects uh on that one um what's what's the next project that uh that stands out for you i think then the next project to talk about then is talking nicely into frame rate which is our project where we're beginning to explore what it means to be able to use time in in capture and that's been a big piece of research for the last two or three years at ScanLab where we've been funded by uh, UK Research and Innovation to explore building the fundamental tools in order to capture and visualize that world. And we've set ourselves quite a broad challenge of looking at landscapes using LiDAR, capturing them once a day or, or more frequently looking at uh you know much smaller objects like people and birds and pelicans and cats and and sort of everything in between like that we've got a pub scene we've got uh uh a, you know bits and bobs in a station in um, bishopsgate in london yeah all all variants of time uh we've been thinking and scratching our head about recording and building the tools to do that um so we've got um, two videos that we could jump into. One is a quick teaser about the, the bigger aims of the projects. Maybe we'll start with that one. All right, so we'll start with this one. So <clears throat> the project's called Frame Rate, and we've been scanning two regions of the UK over the last three years. The first big test zone was Norfolk. Um, and we chose a number of locations really close to some areas that, that we were assured there'd be significant landscape change. <clears throat> and those are at Side Strand and Haysborough, where the cliffs are eroding very quickly into the sea at the rate of you know, about a metre a year. So um, wow. Paul, and, Paul and Brad are Norfolk photographers who came on board for the project for a year, had a sort of 
zen-like existence of going to the same beach every day, setting up a scanner in exactly the same place and firing off a scan. And uh, so we have, you know, an entire year's worth of that beach. And we're actually able to capture this huge landslide, which was just those quick images at the end. Um, and this has been re a really interesting project for us because it's it spans so many collaborative uh, elements. Um, there is a whole layer to do with science going on in here. So we've been talking to the British Geological Survey about what's going on. They reached, well, we reached out to them originally to ask them, you know, which areas of Norfolk would be fantastic places to set up and which were of scientific interest to them. And so we've taken those about 20 terabytes of data from those two locations and shared them uh, with them and they've been doing some science we've just finished writing a paper on that and you know for them to see like daily change for these locations is is like looking through a new set of eyes at these locations they're able to see you know that daily tidal flux they're able to see uh, you know what if they correlate it with the weather information what's happening to you know moisture levels in the cliff and you know Wow, so many things for them to, to investigate and think about that. Um, the other sets of sites which were placed in close proximity to those, because we wanted Paul and Brad to be able to do this kind of daily loop once a day, were uh, Felbrick Manor, where there's a flower garden and a vegetable garden. You know, and it's a, an amazing natural trust property. So you can imagine the garden is just, you know, exquisite. Um, and so we have, uh, you know, corn, we have pumpkins, we have all sorts of amazing things come out of the ground and then die back again. So we've got also- You can see the, you can see the huge pumpkin leaves uh, yeah. around, <laughs> grown up, like, oh, I'm like, mm, coming down, um, cycle of life. Yeah, uh, yeah. and so uh, we've reached out to Q Gardens who are interested in that date set. And if anyone else, um, you know, this is a sort of general open call, if anyone else uh, is doing research, um, and is interested in those data sets, please get in touch. We'll be launching a website to release them uh, in the not too distant future. That's something in construction. And uh, so that was Norfolk and that was very natural based. Um, we then turned the eyes of the scanner on Glasgow uh, and that was in relation to COP26 as well and have looked for far more uh, human impact on the landscape. So we've got uh, a sawmill, uh, we've got a metal recycling plant, We've got a quarry. We've got several city centre locations. We've got some really beautiful bins. You wouldn't have thought a bin alley in central Glasgow would be beautiful, but it is. Um, <laughs> you can see, the, you know, the, <laughs> you can see the sort of kegs build up and go down, and the bins full. And yeah, it's 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 really amazing. And uh, and that was in justice of us putting together work for um, exhibition. Uh, hopefully, it's South by Southwest as a little teaser this March. Fingers crossed. The, the hopefully the pandemic allows. On. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but we're taking the the next layer of that uh, cake and turning it into an experience. Uh, and much like the meditative world that we've done for a uh, few guys, we're pulling out each of these like little sort of you imagine them being like little flip books of animation yeah. where we're making a, f a sort of flip book exhibition but it's all on incredible 4k big screens and at the moment we're hoping we're going to have about eight of those big screens in south by where each one will be looping through various animations and you it is like time lapse in that you can stand in front of it and just admire the detail for about 10 minutes for it just like you know just watching corn grow and die back you can just spend that time really like swimming through it and, and getting into getting into it um so it's a yeah it's a, a sort of installation where we're pulling apart what's going on and, and showing that um so that's that's the kind of creative output of that and we hope for that to expand and be bigger and better as we go through 2022 and 2023. Um, yeah, but you were mentioning a second video that, that uh, we need to look at. Should we 
tackle that one. Yeah, um, let's 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 wrap up on that one. So, um, as part of that like time lapse, we were looking at landscape, but we also wanted to speed it up a little bit and throw some cats and humans at it as well. And so, we've used various different sensors and set them up in our studio and just experimented and, and thought about what it means to be a figure or a human in that time lapse. Um, Let's see what that looks like, because it's super exciting, that one. This is in your studio. Yeah, obviously we've cropped off all of the servers and desks. And... <laughs> Quite spectacular. <laughs> Thank you very much. Quite, spe quite spectacular in, in um, the colors, even like, for, because with every scan, um, it, it tends to be quite dark because um, it, it takes a lot of, so it takes a lot of light out um, somehow. Um, but in this uh, video specifically, it looks um, ethereal. It doesn't look like it's dark from the lack of light. It looks like it's on purpose. But like it's absolutely gorgeous the way it's uh, created. So, um, so that's that's kind of what you're working on right now. Can you tell us a bit about what current projects and where are you at? I, I, unfortunately, I can't tell you too much about them because they're all relatively top secret. But um, yeah, Got lots it. of that. <laughs> Double lots seven of that, kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Lots of that technology is being put to uh, use on you know if you if you sort of. Yeah, take that and scale it up, basically, um, and that's really exciting for us. Uh, if 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 it's causing a little bit of a, a headache for our technical teams to really, they're really pushing ourselves on this one. Um, so, yeah, it, there's lots of really exciting opportunities, um, especially because a lot of our work over the years has been quite uh, removed of humans because it's so static. You know, anything that moves just isn't there. And it's a, you know, and this actually might be a segue into another project, but it depends on time. But the technology is at a stage a little bit like, and it's following a similar trajectory to like photography um, in that, you know, the first early photos had such long exposure times that the only people that were visible were the ones that were quite Victorian. Standing and still. Cozy. Yeah. And I think. Yeah, I should know this. The photographer who did the street scene, I think it's in Leeds, where there's a shoe shine. He's still with the guy having his um, shoes cleaned. It's quite clear, but then the the incredible people passing by are this just blur of what's going on. And that's kind of where our work has been for quite a long time. And now that we can increase the rate at which we capture, or by only in a small area, we can just see a whole different world. And that's quite that's quite exciting for us at the moment. So is that where we're going? Is that where technology is going to uh, more of a uh, up to speed recreation of our day to day? Is that kind of what you're seeing? Yeah, I think, you know, video will come with depth and that just enables a whole new world of quite exciting opportunity, whether that's being able to, you know, do simple things like refocus a photo or really complex things where you, the observer can be totally detached from where it was recorded from so basically making kind of volumetric video and then putting that onto an augmented reality or uh you know virtual reality experience you know we're going to be able to see people in not just us make use of phones to record this and and explore it and it's just going to become quite a prevalent medium through the uh, through the creative industries being able to 
just unlock it without needing a hundred twenty thousand pound scanner that can only record one frame every five minutes we're talking about 30 frames per second on your iphone so yeah it's a different world when you think about allowing people to do that at home um cool technology coming up in the near future hopefully the next five to less than maybe years um uh in terms of uh, industries that are benefiting from this where where do you see that um it's clear that museology you know museums are benefiting the cultural um, um heritage sites are, are benefiting from this uh outside of that we're talking about architecture we're talking about um, um archaeology we're talking about um uh you know the, the, the self-driving cars so uh outside of those where do you see because <laughs> that's, that's enough probably yeah to, i mean it, it, it's it's almost easier to to try and record ones which aren't being touched by you know this technology <laughs> at, at this point I think it's going to be in everything um and that that's quite fascinating you know whether it's uh you know quite historical quite slow moving industries to adopt technology or uh incredibly fast moving uh industries you know gaming being one that's always adopting technology ahead of museums um, yes. has a, such a different pace of innovation and acceptance and those worlds are are far apart but they are really beginning to blur you know students who are coming out of university come out with such incredible digital skills um, that they will be going into industries across the broad and bringing that life and those skills to them and making those changes so yeah i think anyone who's at at school uh, or at university and, and thinking about where the industry goes it's to them to bring that technology to that industry and to, and to transform it and i think that will be that's where the most exciting things will happen um it, it's it's uh, like you said it's exciting to see where the technology can, can take you and also not having to uh close uh, of an idea of what you're planning on doing in the future because We've seen that that changes and that expands uh, massively, um, uh, especially in, in, with the capabilities of, of technology that, 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 that we're seeing, um, you know, the, like this thing in, in storage and processing and, and all of that. So it's helping to create this, this universe that we're talking about, this digital uh, version of our world. Um, but in uh, the reality and in our version of our world and where we're at right now, where you and I are talking, um, I wanted to like uh, say a huge thank you for for all your time and uh, all the projects that you're currently showing us and the amazing tour the force that you took that you, you took us through um, uh, you know with with the work that you've done with uh, replica real replica and the the current projects that you're working on uh, and. Um, yes, huge thank you. And uh, yeah, um, I, I, I would like to keep everybody else uh, up to date with all the projects that you're doing. So we're going to try to have all of those links to your work um, in, uh, in with the video as well. So um, any closing thoughts, Will? No, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I, I, yeah, thank you for listening to me ramble on. And uh, I hope <laughs> someone found it interesting somewhere in the internet. I'm sure they will. Uh, I definitely did, and and I'm sure they will as well. Um, and there, there, you know, there's a lot more. There's there's super fascinating sub subjects that we touched upon today, and I can't wait to see how, how they how they expand. I can't wait to see where your work this uh, work is uh, is going to be taking you. And uh, yeah, I want to say also a huge thank you to everybody that's joined us in today for the conversation for the in conversation series um, under the Deep Fake Art and Double Exhibition Framework. Um, the exhibition again. Is is being held at EPFL Pavilions uh, at uh, EPFL in Lausanne. Um, the exhibition has been extended also until May 1st, and we invite you to join us uh, digitally or in person, probably in person for a uh, you know, proper uh, experience of, of, of this um, uh, installation and uh, the rest of the 21 installations we have in the two pavilions in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, thank you, Will, and uh, thanks everyone again for joining us and we'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye, thank you.